Hello everyone and welcome to this Blender tutorial. My name is Nick van den Broek and today I want to talk to you about volumetrics in Cycles. In Blender 2.71 we have this nice cool new feature called volumetrics. And me and my friends from the Belgian Blender user group were so excited by this new feature that we came together and started experimenting with it. And in this video I want to show you some of the things we've learned on volumetrics and how to use them or how not to use them. So before we get started with the actual tutorial, there are a few things you should know about volumetrics. First of all, there are only three shaders you can use in volumetrics. The emission shader, the volume absorption shader and the volume scatter shader. Using any of the other shaders won't do any good because they won't show up at all in the render. So only use those three shaders. Secondly, you should know that you can only use the CPU. Currently, volumetrics is not supported on the graphical processor. So only CPU and only those three shaders. So let's jump into Blender. There are in fact three big topics where you can use the volumetrics. You can use them for the world volumetrics to create some kind of atmospheric fog. You can create, use them for meshes where you can do very cool things. Or you can use them for cloud, fire and smoke kind of ideas. So let's start with the volumetrics in the world. So I am going to create a very simple scene here with just a ground plane, a cube and above that a spot lamp. So for the spot lamp I'm going to keep the standard emission. I'm going to bump this up to about 200 just to see some more and both the cube and the uh, ground plane will be the standard diffuse shader. So if I now go to the world tab, I can see beside the surface that there's also a volume part. In this volume part, I can now select, for example, the scatter shader. I'm going to check, select a uh, homogeneous volume, which I will explain later on, and I'm going to lower the density to 0.1. Otherwise, it's so dense you don't see anything at all. So if you now go to the viewport and let it render. So you can see that the scattering of the light in our volume is creating this nice cone where you can see the light rays actually com coming down onto our cube. So this is a very nice feature of volumetrics in cycles. It's very easy to use in the world settings. You just use one of the, the shaders here and that's almost everything you need to do. However, this technique has some downsides. First of all, it's kind of slow because not only is there a volume here where we want it, but also up here and, and up here and everywhere else in the scene, Blender will use this volumetrics. Now there are big downsides to using the volumetrics in the world tab. For example, um, normally if I would use this background as a whitish color, you would get a nice, um, lighting of your entire scene. However, in this case, it does absolutely nothing. The reason for this is that this light source that you created using this background is uh, for, bl for Blender infinitely far away. So Blender assumes this light source to be infinitely far away. Hence, it has to come through an infinite amount of volume before it reaches your scene and it will get scattered completely before it ever reaches anything to bounce on. So the same counts for uh, HDRI images. You can't use that as lighting source because they're also infinitely far away and will never reach your scene. But it also counts for example for a sun lamp. So if I add the sun lamp to the scene, nothing changes. Because again, this sun lamp is infinitely far away. Now there are some other perks you need to get used to. For example, I'm watching the scene in the perspective mode at this moment. But if I change to orthorhombic, it seems like everything goes black. That's because the distance is now measured differently and I have to lower this quite a bit before I actually get to see my cube again. So that's something to keep in mind that there's a difference between perspective and orthorhombic view. So in order to uh, escape some of these downsides, there is something different you can do. And uh, that's by creating a mesh to create this cone-like um, shading uh, like volume. 
So let's start by removing the volume from our world settings and you can immediately see that my scene is completely white. That's because we still have this background on it and there is still somewhere this sun lamp that is lighting everything. So let's get rid of all these things and let's just add a simple mesh, a cone. Let's go into side view, orthorhombic and I'm going to model this a bit to follow the cone, roughly the cone of our spot lamp, like this. Then I'm going to go to the materials tab, get a new material, and I'm going to remove the diffuse shader. You could just use a transparent shader, but I'm going to remove it because it works just as well. And then I'm going to add in the volume scatter and put it to the same 0.1 as I did in the volumetrics world. I'm also going to check homogeneous, again I will explain this later on. And if we look at this now in perspective view in Shift-T, you see that you get the same kind of effect, but it's faster. It gives a very nice result. So this is a good way that you can um, still get the same cone-like effect without using the volumetrics. And the advantage is that we now can still use, for example, the background, or you could use a sun lamp as well. All those things still work. You can still use HDRI images as well. Now you could also parent this uh, cone to the lamp and keep it following everywhere. However, there's also, again, a downside. As this is stated in the documents, you can't go into a uh, volumetric mesh because then you will lose the volume. For example, if I check out my camera, it is positioned outside, you can still see the volumetric cone. However, if I now move this uh, camera inside, so just inside, like this, if I now look at um, my rendered view, I don't see any kind of effect from the cone anymore. There's no more volume, the volume is gone. So officially this is not supported, it doesn't work, however we have found that you can uh, tweak it a bit and still get some kind of effect. In order to get this, you select the cone again, so your volumetric mesh, go into edit mode and then you flip the normals so that they point inwards towards your camera. And then what you still need to do is you have to add some uh, extra light pads to the volumetrics, for example let's put it on 2. And if I now render this out, you can now see that you get a lot more noise and this is your volumetrics being built up. So now you can get some kind of volumetrics in there. So this is a way that we found that works in most cases to still get volumetrics inside your um, mesh. So with that said, let's take a closer look at the different shaders for our volumes. So uh, I'm going to remove my cone and I'm going to use, I'm going, let's move this camera to the side and I'm going to use my cube as uh, the volumetric mesh. Let's create some space to add in the node editor here. Let's remove this uh, standard surface shader. And as I said in the beginning, there are three shaders you can use for the volume. This is the volume scatter. You can use the volume absorption or you can use the emission shader. So let's start with the emission shader. It's kind of logic what it does. It uh, emits light from your volume. So the denser, not, not the denser the volume, but the more volume your light rays go through, the more light accumulates and the lighter that, pa that patch will be. So you can change the colors, create some very nice looking things with this. So it's kind of logic what this does, strength will give you more light, it's very very logic. Let's instead look at the volume scatterer. Now the volume scatterer is what you would use for for example clouds and smoke and stuff like that. So what it does is the light is coming from the top and at some point hits my volume and there it gets scattered away. So it's scattered, it bounces inside until it reaches the camera. So the scattering goes in all directions, 
So that's why we can see our volume now, because light goes in and scatters towards the camera. So you can see that there are three options here. I'm not going to talk about anisotropy yet, perhaps uh, in some later comments, but I'm not going to discuss this here. So let's focus a bit about the color. So if I put this, for example, to a reddish color, you see that my cube becomes red. That's because on top we have a white light. Now a white light means that it contains all colors in the spectrum. So it both has red, blue and green and everything in between. Now the reddish light that hits uh, my volume will get scattered away towards the camera. That's why it, sees, it looks red. The blue light and the green light are not touched at all and they go on downwards. So as you can see, the shadow of my cube is now bluish, um, some, some sort of cyan, and that's because that's what left. So all the red light is gone, it's scattered away, and what is left is the cyan, which is the opposite side of the color wheel. Now this becomes even more clear if I uh, set the density, for example, to about five. Now as you can see, as the render follows, is that on top it looks very very red and on the bottom it's becoming to very very vague blue so it's very hard to see but there is a bluish tint here so what's happening is that again the red light is being scattered but now it's scattered so hard up here that by the time the light reaches the middle section all red light is already gone so what is left is the blue light and because we still have here blue 004 some of the blue light is scattered as well. So that's why we have this bluish tint. Now here on the bottom, the blue is much harder. And as you see, if you go and look on the top, you see a lot of red noise, but the blue is still very, very clearly visible. So it's much more bluer than it was with the black background. The reason being that the red is now scattered, so that's the same scattering as before. But now additionally, we have the bounce light from our surface coming back up towards us through the cube. So it's going through the cube again, it again absorbs all the red light and what is left is the blue light hitting the camera. So that's why it looks blue when you have a white background and it looks red when you have a dark background because then it's only the scattering that you see. By the way, apparently Blender doesn't like it if you would put blue all the way to zero then for some reason the entire volume becomes black. So Blender doesn't like it when there's a zero in there. So I advise you to not use the colors on the edge, just keep it slightly away from the edge and then this is it's, it's the very logical result that you get. Now when we look at the volume absorption, you would expect something very very similar. Because from a physical point of view, what this would do is the same as the scattering, except that in scattering the lights get bounced in all kinds of directions, while in absorption it simply disappears. Well, it doesn't disappear in reality, in reality it gets absorbed and becomes heat, and it warms up your surface. But since we're only looking at the light part of the scene, it should just simply vanish. But that's not what happens. So they decided, apparently developers decided to implement this differently. So if I put in the standard volume absorption, I get this um, very slightly darkish kind of uh, cube here. So something very, very vague. So you can amp this up. If I put this higher, it becomes darker. This is logic because you get more absorption. But if I use, turn it, for example, put it reddish here, then you see that my cube simply becomes reddish. So the red color is not absorbed apparently, it just gets uh, a red color. So if you want, for example, create a material where the blue light is absorbed, so if you want to have something that absorbs this blue light, then you should make the material yellowish. So the opposite side of the color wheel. And this means that all the blue light is gone and what is left is the yellow light. So that is how the volume absorption works. Now, there is one uh, extra option that you can't see here in the emission, uh, in the notes shaders. For that you have to use the material tabs and that's the homogeneous volume here. Now if, that, if I check this, it seems like nothing changed at all. 
but actually it does because now my render is faster. Well, my computer is hardly noticeable for this simple scene, but the render should be faster. Because what is this uh, option? Well, homogeneous volume means that the density is the same in all patches of this cube. So wherever you go in the cube, if you cr create a smaller cube in there, it will have the same density. This is in contrary to the heterogeneous volume and the heterogeneous volume, then there will be patches inside this volume with a higher density and patches with lower density. Now this um, checkbox is only to tell Blender, okay, you, we are you working with a homogeneous volume, so assume it's homogeneous because all the volumes I've showed up to now were always homogeneous anyway. This just tells Blender, yes, you are working with a homogeneous volume. And this means that once a light ray hits the side of the cube, Blender can just measure the density once and use that same density throughout the cube, which obviously is faster than when I uncheck it and it has to check the density at each and every step. Now, me and my friends from the Belgian Blender user group were wondering, okay, so if I can use heterogeneous volumes, how can I tell Blender that this is a heterogeneous volume? How can I make those changes in the density? And we have found a way to do this using the textures. So I'm going to show you this with using the emission shader because it's the brightest. It will give you the clearest picture. So let's add in a texture and I'm going to choose the wave texture for now. Now, if you want to use textures, then you also have to tell teacher how to apply the texture. So for this, I'm going to use the texture coordinates and in between, we usually put a, vec a map vector map. I'm going to use the object uh, texture coordinate because then um, the wave texture won't change when I move the cube around because it will be in local coordinates. And let's put this factor into the strength of the emission shader. Now you can already see it happening, but let's uh, put down the scale to about one and then it's going to be much more clear. So now you can very clearly see the bands of the wave texture. So and depending how I look at this, you can almost see through it where the density becomes zero. So this is a very nice way to do this. Um, what some things you can now use other nodes on this, we for example use the mat node with a greater than for example 0 0.9 to have uh, very clear uh, planes in there. So let's amp up the distortion to get more interesting kind of wiggling planes going on and you can get very nice and clear uh, edges with this. Allow me to show uh, one of the other textures as well. So you can use almost all these textures you want. Uh, let's use a checker texture for now as another example. Plug in the vector, plug in the factor, get rid of this one, put the scale to one and you can very, very nicely see this um, cubish uh, checker pattern appearing. So this is the advantage of using the uh, built-in textures of Blender. They are defined in three dimensions and not only in two dimensions. If you would use an image plane, I don't know how this is going to work because then it only has two dimensional information. Uh, if you don't think this is strong enough, then you can add in a multiply and make it l brighter. I don't think I need to explain this part at all. So you can get very nice features with this. Now let's look back at the wave texture and there was something we were wondering. Okay, so we were able to achieve uh, inhomogeneous volumes in this way. So what would happen now if we would check homogeneous anyway? In order to better understand what this button does, we wanted to check it anyway. Now before I do this, allow me to explain that this is very, very uh, stupid thing to do. Well, not stupid, but just strange because we have an inhomogeneous volume Telling Blender to treat it as a homogeneous volume is a certain way to get very strange results. And that's what we get. So for example, if I click this, we get this. So at first sight, it seems that only the uh, surfaces of our cube remain uh, visible. So it's, it looks like there's no more volume. 
but that's not completely true. So what's happening is that light bounces, hits our surface, and then um, Blender measures the density at some point. Now here it will measure 1, and there it will measure 0. And then it uses that same um, density throughout the remainder of the volume. So that's why we get this surface-like um, scattering uh, effect. But there is still a volume matrix uh, in play. For example, you can see that the colors become darker towards the edges, where there is less volume to go through. And you can also see, if I now move my cube towards my ground plane, at the moment they intersect, you can see the inside of my volume. So if I put this lower, you can see it almost scans, uh, it, it, it looks like it scans the, the inside of the volume matrix. So you can use this for nice scanning through kind of object uh, ID. But that's what when you misuse this homogeneous volume. So I think I said uh, everything I wanted to say. There is one final thing that you can use volumetrics for, and that is clouds and fire and smoke. But I'm not going to elaborate on that because Blender HD has already created a very nice tutorial on this. So I invite you to watch that one if you want to learn more about fire and clouds and stuff like that. And the uh, only thing remaining for me is to thank you for listening. If you have any questions or if you did your own experiments and want to add to this tutorial, please share them in the comments and uh, share your knowledge. Thank you very much for listening and I'll see you later.